of studies in the life of Christ. We're going to be focused on Luke chapter 6. And the parallel passage is Mark 3. And then the famous Sermon on the Mount passage in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But Luke 6 is where we're going to do uh, spend uh, most of the time in terms of the chronological progression. And again, it's mirrored in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 3 as well. You can compare the two chapters together. Well, we start off, uh, Jesus, <clears throat> he selects the 12 apostles, the first leadership group in the church. Very significant decision, because if this decision is wrong, it all goes wrong. Then secondly, he modeled kingdom ministry. As we'll see in a moment, he healed the sick, cast out demons, and then he gave them the most concise and precise summary of kingdom lifestyle. The Sermon on the Mount is the most compact, comprehensive discipleship manual in the Bible, where Jesus lays out the 10 or 20 key points that if you want to disciple somebody, or you want to be a disciple, these are the points of focus. And uh, we'll look at that, and I give a summary at the very end to bring it all together, all the points that, uh, the major points that he emphasized. Well, let's begin in Luke chapter 6. He went out to the mountain <clears throat> to pray, and he, can, he continued all night in prayer. Then, verse 13, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12, and he named them apostles. Now, there's a, a, a number of things I want to point out here. The most, I mean, a most remarkable statement is the reality that Jesus spent a night in prayer before he made these very significant decisions, before he gave his most important sermon, and probably had his largest healing meeting. All of those, all those happened the next day. And understanding the gravity and the weight of these very essential decisions of picking the right people, giving the right message precisely, and again, the largest healing gathering probably in the Bible is right here in this passage in Luke 6, and it's developed more in Mark chapter 3. He spends a night in prayer. Now, you think the most anointed man who ever walked the earth, who had perfect communion with God, who had the fullness of the Spirit on him, would be the one man who would need to spend a night in prayer. But he does. And what Luke is, is emphasizing is two things. The humanity of Jesus. Because everything that Jesus did in his humanity, he did in reliance upon the anointing of the Spirit and communion with God. I mean, all that there is of God, he possessed, but he never drew on his own deity, so to speak. He always lived in dependence as a man on the anointing that was resting on him. So he had to pray like we pray. But again, the most anointed, the deepest communion with God, the greatest wisdom, no sin whatsoever, but he felt it was mandatory and necessary to spend this kind of time in prayer. I look at that and I say, Lord, what do you know about what prayer does in our life that we don't grasp? Of course, there's a lot, but he spends all night. I mean, the intensity of this. Verse 12, he went to the mountain. In modern language, he turned off his cell phone. <laughs> but really, I mean, that's cute, but really. He went to the mountain. He got away from everything to where he would not be drawn into any kind of distractions, even important issues. He continued all night. And from them, he chose the twelve. I want you to notice the phrase from them. He has a larger group of disciples. Matter of fact, a, a quite large group. He picks the 70 from that group. Later on, then the 120 that were in the upper room, they were in that group. And so there's a, Luke chapter 8, there's a group of women that are traveling with him that are being his, resourcing him financially. So there's quite a few disciples that are not uh, listed, but it's from them he chose the 12, and he named them. Whenever Jesus names a person, a city, 
or a ministry office, you know it's very significant. He named them apostles, sent by God with authority. That was the name he put on them. Sent by God with his authority, because that's what an apostle was in that context there. Now this happens about the summer of A.D. 28. And again, we're operating off of the the uh, uh, theory, and it's a well-known one, I mean, it's a well-established one, that Jesus began his ministry at the Passover. I mean, his, his first Passover was, was uh, April in AD 27, and he died in April AD 30. And so, I mean, there's a couple other ways that people figure it, but that's a very popular one. I think that's the most accurate view. And so he's got about two years, just less than two years, that he's going to be with the apostles after he names them and he anoints them and he authorizes them to represent him. Paragraph C, again, I want to mention this model of prayer. He's going to make the most significant decisions in the kingdom. He's going to give the most significant message and he's going to probably have the largest healing ministry all in the same day, the next day. And so he declares his dependence upon the Father. Now this is something Luke, who wrote obviously wrote the Gospel of Luke, and Luke wrote the book of Acts. You'll notice in the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts, the prayer ministry of Jesus in Luke is highlighted beyond any of the other Gospels. It's like Luke was just really fascinated by the prayer dynamic. The prayer parables are in Luke in a way they're not in the other ones. And in the gospel, I mean, in the book of Acts, the prayer life of the apostles in the early church, Luke really emphasizes it because this really captured him by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at paragraph D. <clears throat> paragraph uh, Mark chapter 3. Now, we're, we're going to take Mark 3 because we're staying with Luke 6, but Mark 3 supplements it. And I want to give you a little bit more insight on what's going on that Luke doesn't capture. Mark 3, verse 13. He went up to the mountain. Now, Mark doesn't mention he spent the night in prayer. That's a pretty significant omission. But uh, Mark was being led by the Spirit. But listen to what it says. He called to him those that he himself wanted. What an amazing statement. This is where his sovereignty and desire come together. Somebody might say, why did you choose them? And he would say, God the Father sovereignly chose them, and I really, really wanted them. I really like them. And so God's sovereignty combines with intense desire in his relationship with his people. Because sometimes we think of sovereignty as this remote, kind of far away decision that is kind of sent down through the system somewhere, and there it is, the sovereign decree. But there's desire. Jesus actually was engaged in the heart level with what his father declared, declared to him. It says he called them to himself, and they came to him. You know, many people are called, but they don't actually respond. These 12 left everything and came to him. I mean, the Lord's call has come to us in this room in various ways. And the way we respond in different seasons of our lives is different. But what's important, we must respond. And this is a phrase that we can pass by and not really capture. They came to him. My question, whatever season of life you're in, whatever the ministry challenge and assignment, are you saying yes? Are you rising up and taking hold of it? Because as glorious as it is to partner with the Lord, there's always challenges. There's setbacks. There's opposition. There's resistance. There's difficulty. But it says they came to him. And there's a dozen reasons why it wasn't that good in the natural for them to leave everything to go do this. Now, I'm not saying you need to leave your, uh, your father and mother and your home and it, that's it, uh, uh, like they did. But whatever the call is, it's key that we don't just say, well, you know, the grace of God, no matter what, it's going to happen anyway. No, we must come to him. There must be a response. He won't do it separated from our response to him. <clears throat> Verse 14, he appointed the 12. <clears throat> now notice this, that they might be with him. 
that he might send them out to preach, and they would heal the sick and cast out demons. Now, notice the three things here. Our first calling is to be with him. Some of us kind of think of our first calling as mostly to make the message known. It's really important. Some think, no, the, the, real, the real stuff is the realm of the, of the miracles and the casting out devils. That's true. That's true. Well, which is it? Is it to be with them? Is it to go deep in the word and be faithful witnesses? Or is it to really give our energy to pray for the sick and grow in faith and cast out devils? Well, that's the order that Jesus laid it out right here. He wants all three of them. Now, in different seasons, we will emphasize one more than the other, typically. I mean, we want to carry all three of them throughout our life. You know, you've heard the old saying, seek his face, not his hand. But that's not a biblical reality. We don't seek his face and not his hand. We seek his face and his hand. We do both. We want to be with him, but we want to be his ambassadors. We want to speak the word, but we want to pray for the sick. We want to see the miraculous. And so some camps focus on one of those three. Intimacy and prayer, be with him. Preach the word. No, get out in the streets or be a, a messenger. You know, uh, eat the scroll and go deep in the word. Be a faithful witness. Others, no, nah, don't do that. I mean, really extend your strength. Cast out devils, heal the sick. I mean, really develop that part of your faith. And I say we, we want to do all three of them. And we say, Holy Spirit, we have limited time. We have limited strength. But with our strength, we want to grow in all three of these issues. But Jesus is on purpose setting forth the model of how ministry works. And so you don't want to pick between the three. We want to embrace all three of them. Now, paragraph one, the, the apostles, they were the first ones to function as the officially recognized officers. I mean, Jesus was the official representation of the Father. He spoke the Father's message, lived the lifestyle the Father told him. He did the Father's apostles. Now you're going to do what I do with the Father. It says in John chapter 20, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I'm, it's going to be reflected now in you. You're going to be with the Father. You're going to say what the Father once said, and you want to do the works of the Father. You are my official representation. Now, paragraph two, lest you think, well, the apostles, that was amazing, they did it. Jesus, after he died and rose from the dead, he says, let me remind you of one thing, Mark chapter 16. These signs will follow everyone who believes. Don't look at the Old Testament, I mean, the New Testament story and say, well, that was then and this is now. Jesus said, these signs will follow. Now, they follow those that believe, meaning the believers are moving forward in the kingdom. They're engaging in relationship. They're helping people. They're being practical in their service. And as they're doing that and they're speaking the word, signs follow. You know, we'd like to do it the other way around. Sit quietly and just say, Lord, do miracles, and then I'll jump into the, I'll get into the fray. I'll, I'll really jump in. If you show me amazing supernatural things, then I'll jump in. Jesus said, no, jump in, go deep in prayer, grow in the word, speak the word, serve people, reach out, signs will follow you. Lord, why don't I just sit in isolation and wait for the signs, and then I'll start doing the work. These signs will follow. In my name, they cast out demons. They speak with new tongues. They lay hands on the sick, and the sick recover. Beloved, this is our mandate from the Father. We can cast out demons. Now, don't imagine that casting out a demon always means a dramatic, you lay hands on them and they roll over the floor and they froth in the mouth like they did in that one movie, that type of thing. That really might happen sometime. I've seen a couple really strange ones. But you can cast out demons without a major manifestation by using the name of Jesus. It's in his name. It's not your power. It's not your energy. It's not the strength of your voice. Like if you really mean it, the demon will come out. 
But if you only sort of mean it, the demon won't come out. No, it's the, the authority of Jesus, not the intensity of your personality that makes the demon come out. They respond to Jesus. So you can be tired, but the Holy Spirit's not tired. You can have a real soft uh, spoken personality, but the Holy Spirit's just as powerful. You can be seven years old and there's not a baby Holy Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit. So you can be young, untrained, soft-spoken, and tired, but the Holy Spirit says, I'm none of those. Speak in my name. Press into God's heart. Be with him. Grow in the word. Serve people. Relate to people. And signs will follow as you speak the word over people. Well, Paul said the same thing in essence, but he used different language. I love this language. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God reconciled us to himself through Jesus. Oh, that's beautiful. But it doesn't begin, it doesn't end with you being reconciled to God, you being saved. He gave you, he gave you. He's gonna use you to bring the word to others. And it's not only the word of how an unbeliever enters the kingdom, for sure it means that. But it's how an, a believer who's lost their way in discouragement or in compromise or in guilt or in confusion, you're helping them to get reconciled to the call of God on their life. So don't only think of evangelism. We are ministers of reconciliation in the church, outside the church, but don't only, don't only think of the church either, think of the lost. But don't limit it to anything. Wherever God's will is not being done in someone's life, the Lord says, you are my ambassador. You are my spokesperson to speak the word because the spirit typically moves in response to the declaration of the word. And when I mean the declaration, again, I don't mean so, it has to be real extravagant. You can whisper it. The spirit moves when the word is spoken. You might be speaking to a discouraged, depressed believer, and you tell them the truth. And you pray, lay hands on them. Real simple. And uh, Paul says, look at, look, look at verse 19. That God was in Christ, reconciling the word to, world to himself. Beloved, he's not imputed sin to us. Our sin has been removed. This is amazing. But here's what it says. He committed to you the word of reconciliation. Whether it's a depressed Christian whether it's a confused, despairing Christian, one in compromise, filled with shame, an unbeliever, in any kind of condition, the word of reconciliation has been entrusted to you. It's simple. We say the promises of Jesus. If we say them, the Spirit moves on hearts. If we don't say them, a whole lot doesn't happen. And a lot of people are waiting on God sovereignly just to do big things while they sit idly. And Jesus says, here's the model. I've called you, be with me, preach the word, and speak my word over people and believe for the spirit to touch them. That's the model here. Let's talk, turn to the top of page two. Well, Jesus, he now chooses the 12. Now, I put a little bit of information on this page you're not going to cover. But there's four different lists in the New Testament of the 12 apostles. There's Matthew 10, Mark 3, we're here in Luke 6, and then Acts chapter 1. They're, they're, they're all listed together. I mean, the apostles are laid out here. Now, paragraph B, number 1, just I find this interesting, that all 11, 11 of the apostles are from uh, Galilee, they're up north. They're outside of the circle of power, which is the Jerusalem institution. All of them are uneducated, untrained, untrained spiritually, I mean, uh, in the Bible. They were, the, uh, the Pharisees, the, the power base in Jerusalem, complained, you're all outsiders, and none of you are trained, you're unlearned men, meaning they, they, they didn't know all the, the theology and the deep training, you know, 10, 20 years of, of deep training, many of the Pharisees had it, and more than that. But they're all Galileans. And the point being, they're outsiders, and the Lord says, 
I'm choosing you. You're not outside of my reach because you're not in the inner circle of the religious institutions of your day. You're not outside of my reach. Now, the only one interesting that was from the south, which is around uh, Jerusalem, Judea, was uh, Judas Iscariot. He was the only one that was down from the south. Now, we're not against the south. That's not what that's about because a lot of miracles happened down there as well. That's interesting that the names of these apostles are Hebrew or Aramaic names, but two of them, Philip and Andrew, they were, they, they, they were Greek names. And again, this is a statement that God's saying, I'm choosing people outside the inner circles. I'm choosing people outside of even the, the norms of the day, which would have been uh, you know, the, the Greek, I, I, I mean the uh, Hebrew and Aramaic names that would have been common in the culture. And then Jesus names three of them, gives them a new name. He tells Peter or Simon, hey, your new name's Peter. Your new name's The Rock. He took James and John. He goes, I'm going to give you guys a new name. Your son's Thunder. That's what your name is from now on, Sons of Thunder. So it's interesting how he, he chooses and even renames. Now, paragraph two, it's pretty obvious, but it's just worth pointing out that there was an inner circle, particularly three of them among the 12, that had a closer relationship to the Lord. So there's the 12, and then there's three among the 12. Well, you could make it bigger circles. There's the 500. 1 Corinthians 15, he appeared in the resurrection to 500 at one time. I mean, that's a pretty cool group. How would you like to be in that meeting where Jesus appeared in a physical body to 500 people and they all saw it as eyewitnesses at the same time? I mean, what if he appeared in this room and everybody saw it? There's no mistake. There's the 500. Well, there's the 120 who made it to the upper room. I wonder why the rest of the 500 didn't show up to the prayer room that time. But anyway, that's another question for another time. Then there's the 70 among the 120. The 120 went to the upper room, but 70. But then there were 12 among them, or, or even more distinct, and there's three among the 12. And it's Peter, James, and John. And those were the three that Jesus gave a new name to as well. Now, the reason we, we I even point that out is because I pay more attention to them meaning when I'm reading the Gospels in the book of Acts, I pay more attention to their responses because the Scripture is highlighting that Jesus delighted, in essence, I think there's an underlying message, he delighted in how they responded to him. Now, they, their failures are in the Scripture. James and John, their arrogance, they wanted to call fire down on a city and burn it because they, the city wouldn't respond to their ministry. They went to Jesus in Luke 9 and said, can we just send fire and burn the city? Jesus goes, no, no, let's not burn the city. Let's not do that, James and John. James and John were the two arguing, hey, could we be above all the other 12 apostles in the age to come? Could we be your right and left? And John would say, I mean, Jesus could say, James and John, you guys are sons of thunder, but I need to redeem that quality in you, and I need to have you thunderous in the right direction, which he made them that. Well, he named Peter the rock, the unstable Peter, who four or five times his instability and his unreliable character he, it surfaces, but Jesus said, I call you the rock, I call you the rock, and eventually he responded as a rock. So it's interesting, these three, he renamed them, and over time, we see them living up and responding according to the way that God named them. But I care about this because I want to be a rock and a son of thunder. I want to respond this way to the Lord, and so do you. Well, paragraph C, we just looked at uh, Simon. He's Peter. We just talked about that. And D, there's the passage about the sons of thunder. Again, they were the thunderous passionate personality. They were expressing it in a wrong way on occasion, but it got redeemed. I'm sure there were some, some uh, challenges along the way while the Lord's transforming them. Some of you in this room, your personality, you're born that way, your sons of thunder. Whether you're male or female, I mean, you got that thunder in your personality. You were one of those, 
Ones where when you were two and three years old, your parents went, oh my, here we go. This is going to be intense. Yeah, you can tell who they are. They're the people laughing just now. Okay. And the Lord says, you know what? I want that thunder. I want to make you a son of thunder fully in the other direction from just your natural bent. And of course, many of you, you're already on that journey and the Lord's already doing it. But the Lord wants us to be transformed from our natural way. And he's using these apostles in their humanity and their story to give us a storyline to encourage us in our own transformation. Paragraph, paragraph E, Bartholomew was probably Nathaniel from John chapter 1. Most uh, commentaries agree that Bartholomew and Nathaniel is the same. I got a little bit on that. Let's go down to paragraph G, Simon the Zealot. Now a zealot, they were involved in the political movement to use violence against Rome because Rome was really oppressing them. And they were looking for the Messiah to come as a king that would come in force. And he is going to come in force at the second coming. But he came in meekness at the first coming, like we looked at last week in Matthew 12. He didn't raise his voice in the street. He didn't raise a political military revolution against Rome. He came to die. Well, this zealot, I mean, he was going really intense one way. And Jesus says, Simon... I'm going to turn your passions around. I mean, kind of like James and John, the sons of thunder. And I'm going to take that zeal, but I don't want you manifesting it with violence in your own zeal, in your own way, in your own time. I want you to use that zeal, but through the lens of the kingdom. And so I think that for a zealot, a kind of guy or gal that would have joined that kind of movement, this was a real challenge to reinterpret the way they are to express their commitment and their passion. Like in our culture today, I mean, in our own nation, or in the world, there's lots of zealots out there. And they believe in their cause and they believe in their methods. But James chapter 1 says, verse 19, the anger of man never accomplishes the purpose of God. Never. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. The anger of man, the frustration of man, the lashing out of man. It might move men, but it never accomplishes God's righteous purpose, ever. It always sets it back. And I know the, uh, a number of believers, they, they think that as long as they're pushing hard, it doesn't matter. I mean, they're in all the way, and Jesus says, Simon the Zealot, you gotta do it my way. Sons of thunder, you gotta do it my way. Because the anger of man is never, ever gonna accomplish the purposes of God. Okay, let's turn to page three. Well, he's picked the 12 in Luke 6, verse 12 and 13, 14, 15. <clears throat> now he's going to, uh, verse 17, he comes down the mountain. And here, it's an interesting phrase, he stood on a level place. The great multitude is there from all of Judea and Jerusalem and Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are up north in Syria, in the region of Syria. Lebanon and Syria would be in that region. And uh, they came down to, to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And again, the people want the teaching and they want the power. And again, as, as his disciples, we want to go, we want to do the teaching. I don't mean everyone's going to teach publicly, but everybody's a teacher, even if it's one-on-one -on -one, through encouraging people. Of course, in the, you know, in the social media uh, generation, everybody can be a teacher now. It doesn't matter what kind of personality, there's, there's a, a platform for anybody to speak the word of God. So we're all called to be teachers in that regard. Well, what is it? Is it teaching or is it power? Is it power or teaching or is it being with him? And again, Jesus said it clear earlier in the passage. It's all three of them together. Verse 20, then he lifted up his eyes towards his, his disciples, and he said, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And so he goes on through the rest of Matthew, I mean Luke 6, from verse 20 all the way to verse 49, and he gives an abbreviated version of the Sermon on the Mount. But instead of doing the Luke 6 abbreviated version, we're going to slide over now to Matthew 5, 6, 7, and 8. We're going to do the, the more complete version of the Sermon. 
Now remember, the Gospel of Matthew is not in chronological order. The Gospel of Matthew is laid out, it's organized by, by, uh, in a thematic way, according to themes. That's why if you want to get the chronology, read Mark and Luke, or even John. Although John builds the whole story around Jesus' visits to Jerusalem at Passover. I mean, the whole Gospel of John is about Jesus in Jerusalem at Passover, year by year by year. But so Mark and Luke is the chronology. Matthew, again, you're going to read Matthew and, and the Sermon on the Mount at the very beginning of it. You're thinking, what's the deal here? Matthew says, no, I'm laying out the themes systematically. And so we're going to go to, the, uh, to Matthew chapter 5. But before we do that, I just want to make this little simple point here in paragraph A in the notes that in Luke 6, it's often called the Sermon on the Plain, whereas Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is called the Sermon on the Mount or the Mountain is the idea. And of course, it's the mountain in Galilee by Capernaum or by the Sea of Galilee. It's the mountain right by that sea there or right by Capernaum, which is on the sea. I mean, right next to the sea. And so... Theologians debate, did he do it on a plane? Because remember, we just read in verse 17, he came down from the mountain, he stood on a level place, on a plain area. Or did he speak on the mountain? And I think, I don't know, I think the simplest answer is he gave the same message many, many, many times. He didn't give the Sermon on the Mount one time and says, well, check, I got that one done, let's move on. I believe he gave the same messages over and over and over again. And he put a parable t one time and another time, the par another parable. And just like any preacher today would do, he doesn't say it exactly the same way every time, but he emphasizes different points at different times. Well, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, or the Sermon on the Plain, Matthew, uh, Luke 6, the abbreviated version, is the most important message it's the summary message of the most important things Jesus wanted us to receive in his teaching. So if you want to get what he wanted you to get in terms of lifestyle, Sermon on the Mount is where you got to go. If you want to disciple people, you want to teach them in kingdom values, Sermon on the Mount. If you only have one portion of scripture to learn kingdom lifestyle, to be a faithful disciple or to teach it, go to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Again, Luke 6 is the abbreviated version, but let's go to the larger version. I mean, the more extended one, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Now, I call this the constitution of the kingdom. I mean, it's the, it's the kingdom lifestyle laid out one, two, three, four. The values are put there one, one after the other. Again, this is the this is the most comprehensive statement of how you and I co can cooperate with the grace of God. Meaning this is what God wants me to do in my values and lifestyle when I talk to the Holy Spirit and draw on the grace of God. This is what it's supposed to look like as it unfolds in my life and your life over the years. As a Bible teacher and as a pastor, this is what I want to teach more than anything else. Now, you don't have to go to Matthew 5, 6, and 7 to teach it. But he's, I look at Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as like a table of contents of all the key subjects. You don't have to use those verses. You can teach them from Paul or the Old Testament prophets. But this is the table of contents of the most important lifestyle character value issues for, uh, in the kingdom of God. You want to teach them in your family? You want to teach them to new believers? You want to... You want to put a mirror up in front of you, the mirror of the Word of God. These are the things you want to make sure you're doing. Now, at the end of this, on page 4 at the very end, and we'll get there in a minute, I put a whole summary of what I think. I put uh, all the key ideas in a most succinct, kind of general uh, way. So it's a table of contents, so to speak, a summary of what the key points that are that Jesus wants you to embrace and he wants you to teach. But let's start at the first of the Sermon on the Mount. Paragraph B. We're back. Now we've moved over to Matthew 5, the more extended version of, of, this, of this message. Well, he starts off with the eight Beatitudes. Now I call these, this, uh, these Beatitudes, I, I say these are the eight beautiful flowers 
that God wants to bloom in the garden of our heart. The, the, the Sermon on the Mount, the key point is these eight values and attitudes maturing in your life. If these eight mature, you are a mature, faithful believer. If these eight, if you neglect them, doesn't mean you're insincere, but it means you're not mature. You measure your maturity, not that you really can. I, I don't know, someone says, are, are you further along than you used to be? I go, I hope. I, uh, you know, I don't have, a, you know, like the little boy goes against the wall and mommy marks him and next year he goes, hey, I'm an inch taller. You don't really have anything where you can quite measure you know, I've, I've been asked many times, are you further than you were a few years ago? I go, I don't have a little measure. I go, a little Mikey grew this year, you know. It doesn't work that way. But if I was going to measure myself, which I don't, but I stare at these eight attitudes, and I stare at them all the time, or stare at them is probably not the right way to say it. I talk to God about these eight. Am I growing in these eight attitudes? And sometimes you grow three steps forward, two steps back. But over time, you're still making progress. It's not unbroken progress that there's never setbacks, but you're continually over the years, these eight issues must be growing if we're going to mature spiritually. Now, I'm not I'm trying to embarrass you, but I, I want you to have a, just a little like <gasps> moment inside your heart. Nobody else will know you're having it. If I asked you, close your Bible, Look up, tell me the eight Beatitudes from your heart because you've talked to God about them that many times. Some of you would go, oh, blessed are the poor, you know, that one. And my point is it to make you feel, oh, but I want you to register, man, I don't know if I talk to God about these eight very much. Because if you do, they'll be right there on your mind. These are the eight subjects you want to talk to God about most related to your character and related to your shepherding or teaching of other people, these eight issues. You don't have to use these terms, but these are the values. Number one, verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit. What he's saying here, blessed is the man or woman that's aware of their need, how much they lack compared to how much God is made available to them. Poor in spirit, I see how much the Lord has made available, how much I'm not walking in compared to what's available. I go, ah, I want more. The Lord says, that's good. I want you to know there's more for you to enter into. I want you to be poor in spirit, to see your condition in that regard. Even as a believer, we never graduate from these attitudes. The further I get in the Lord, the more aware I am of how much is available that I'm not fully walking in at my mind and heart level. That's called being poor in spirit if you're aware of that. Paragraph, I mean, B, blessed are those who mourn. This is the, this is the sad feeling we feel over the gap between what's available and what we're walking in. Now, I don't mean you walk around sad all the time, but you go, I'm not content where I am. It's not okay. I'm not, this isn't just business as usual. Get along and be happy. Yes, there's joy in our life, but I am not content where I'm at. I'm disturbed. I'm troubled where I'm at. That's what it means. Blessed are they that mourn. You're, it's not okay where you're at right now. You're going to do something about it, which is you're going to respond in a more consistent way. Then it goes on, verse five, blessed are the meek. Now the meek are the people that see their resources. They see all that they have as belonging to Jesus. So therefore, they're going to use their resources under his leadership. Now here's the real attitude of the meek. The meek, instead of being entitled, instead of complaining about what's happening and not happening, they're grateful. They're indebted because everything they have is his. It's not theirs anyway. So they're not living in complaint and, and entitlement and how, you know, God, how come I'm not getting what I deserve? They're meek. They're seeing all that they have as belonging to another, and they're grateful for whatever it is, and they trust in his leadership. That's a spirit of meekness, so they're carrying their heart in that way. Verse 6, blessed are those that hunger and thirst. And again, they're seeking. They're saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press into God. I'm going to let go of what's getting in the way. I'm going to pursue with, with a great tenacity. And it's not like every day is a hot pursuit, but you want hunger and thirst throughout the course of our weeks and months, year by year of our life. Number seven, verse seven, blessed are the merciful. 
This is the attitude we have towards people who fail. People who fail God, we don't look at him and go, oh, you know, poor brother so-and-so, and we whisper about him. Our people who fail us, they're not treating us the way we want. Jesus says, be merciful. If, they, if they're not giving you what you deserve, or maybe it's not about you, don't look at them in a judgmental way. That will set you back. Walk in mercy each step of the way, whether it touches you personally or not. Then he goes on, blessed are the pure in heart. That's pure in terms of motives, and that's pure in terms of morals in our life. Purity. And Jesus said, you'll see God more clearly. Purity really matters. It's not enough just to get forgiven and, and die and go to heaven. I want to I see God more. I want to feel his presence. Jesus says, you got to walk in purity. you got to make it a life ambition that your morals and your motives would be more lined up with God's purity. You're constantly lining up your heart in those areas and not being content with where you're at. Verse, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. These are the people... They use their resource, they use their influence to bring unity and reconciliation. They want to unify. Now, everybody likes that verse, blessed are the peacemakers. But when, you know, a couple friends come and tell you about one of your other friends and they whisper to you, and you go, yeah, I know he is that way. He's really a pain in the neck. I get it. Right now is a chance, right then is a chance to be a peacemaker. A peacemaker doesn't take the idea that's negative and reinforce it. But the peacemaker takes the negative information and they want to shed any redemptive light on it to make two other members of the body of Christ stronger. A peacemaker doesn't hear the story and pass it on. A peacemaker is doing anything they can to use their influence, their information, their, their position to shed light on the situation redemptively to have the complaint one person has with another go away. And that's an amazing ministry in the church and in society as well. And then verse 10, blessed are the persecuted. I mean, when people treat you wrong because you're standing for God, Jesus said, that's good. You really, that's good for you. The pay is really good if they do that. And so don't get into a, I can't believe they're saying this about me on the internet. Jesus says, no, forget all that stuff. Rejoice, be happy. They do that to me. They did it to me. Your, your, your reward in heaven is great. So those are the eight attitudes of the kingdom. Those are the eight you want to look at more than anything else. Those eight. Okay, now, paragraph C. And I'm just going to give the briefest kind of snapshot in the next 10 minutes of the rest of this. And for those of you that are stirred up by this, which I hope uh, uh, you know, a number of you are, that I have a series on the internet, 12 sessions on the Sermon on the Mount, where we take them verse by verse and look through every single one of these. I mean, not real in depth, but we, you know, eight one hour, I mean, 12 one hour sessions where we tease them apart a little bit. Even that's a pretty brief look at the Sermon on the Mount. But the Sermon on the Mount, you really want to know these things. You, I mean, you really, really want to know the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so after the eight Beatitudes, paragraph C, Jesus gives two metaphors salt and light. He goes, no matter how dark it gets in society, I mean, in the generation the Lord returns, it's gonna, darkness is going to cover the earth. But Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2, but the light of the glory of God will shine. Beloved, we are going to be agents of change and bringers of light when the darkness increases, and we're going to be salt where decay has set in. So no matter how bad it gets, God is going to be using the body of Christ as salt and light. And I got a little bit on that. But it's only if they walk in the eight Beatitudes. Meaning, you don't start in verse 13. I want to be salt and light. You start with the eight Beatitudes because that's how the salt and light works. is by communities of believers living out those eight Beatitudes together. Paragraph D. Then Jesus makes one of the great, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Jesus makes this most remarkable statement. He says, verse 19, whoever, whoever breaks the least of these commandments. He's talking about the eight Beatitudes and some other things that he's laying out there. But the eight Beatitudes are the center of his argument, the center of his point, uh, of his uh, message. They'll be least in the kingdom. He's not talking about unbelievers. That in, at the end of the sermon, you know, Matthew 7, at the very end, he says, some will say, 
Lord, Lord, he'll say, I, you are not even in the kingdom. I don't even know who you are. So he's not talking here to people that are not even in the kingdom that are deceived. He's talking to people that will be in heaven. They'll be in the new Jerusalem. Even when heaven comes down to the earth, they'll have a resurrected body in the new Jerusalem, reigning on the earth. Jesus said they'll be least. Because in that day, there will be greatest and least in that day. Everybody won't be the same. Everybody will be loved the same, but everybody will not have the same reward and response from God in terms of their, their assignment, the glory of God that he releases in them. There'll be different measures on every single believer. Now look at, here's the verse I really like. Look, whoever, whoever does and teaches these beatitudes, in essence, I'm gonna really sum it up here, will be called great. Beloved, you can have the least amount of gifting, the least amount of education, no friends, no influence, no money, no opportunity. Put 10 more things on that. No, no, no of all those things. But if you do these things, these eight beatitudes, and you just tell them to the kid in the neighborhood, the only person that will listen to you. Jesus said, I tell you, I will call you great in the age to come. Doesn't matter how big your, your sphere is. You do these in the secret place of your heart, and you talk people into them. Even if it's ones and twos, doesn't matter how big your crowd is. You will be called great by my lips in the age to come. I will call your life choices great. And I will release the, because everyone again will have a different capacity in the glory of God in the resurrected bodies. There's much in the Bible about that subject. Now, a lot of folks don't like that. I've talked to people, they go, when I hear that, that pressures me. I go, good, that's called holy pressure. <laughs> There's more you can enter into. And I don't care who rejects you or what opportunity you miss in this age, you can be great if you will do these eight beatitudes and talk others into doing these eight beatitudes. Even if it's one or two people, you're doing them and you're teaching them. Now, paragraph E, now you'll find that as you read this, these eight beatitudes, these eight flowers of the heart, they are... We, the, the analogy I use, we pull the weeds out of our garden and we water our garden. We remove the negatives and we add the positives. So what happens is in paragraph F, the six negatives, the six natural temptations that human beings have, they're like weeds in the garden. Jesus said, you resist these six areas. Now, everybody has, is different, so one guy is tempted with two or three of these more than the other, and the other guy, it's opposite. But Jesus says, I know the human frame. Here are six temptations that are common to the human race. They're like weeds. You, res you let these temptations overrule, overtake you, they'll choke out the eight beatitudes. Those eight flowers will be choked out in your life. And so I list those out there. And again, we need more time than this, but I'm just giving you a snapshot. Those of you that are discipling people, these, eight, these six negatives, you want to teach them to resist these six negatives in their life. Then paragraph G, there's five positives. There's five ways, nutrients, that you water the garden. Now that's what he takes on next. These are five activities you embrace. Now, by embracing them, you don't earn anything, but you position your cold heart in front of the bonfire of God's presence. It's through serving, giving, praying, fasting, blessing. He lays them out there, five act activities, one after the others, because some people look at those five activities, they go, I don't want to do that prayer and fasting and forgiving thing. I'm in the grace of God, what Jesus says. Sermon on the Mount is how the grace of God operates in your life. Don't let anybody talk you out of prayer, fasting, blessing, serving, and giving as though it's some, well, you're just trying to earn your way. Now, you can do it in a wrong spirit. You can do those five things to get attention so people will praise your name and bless you. That's wrong. Or you can do those five things trying to earn God's love. That's wrong. But if you know God loves you, and you invest your life in these five ways, those eight beatitude flowers will grow in the garden of your life. Okay, page 10. Uh, oops, I mean, uh, top of page four. 
Got all excited there, didn't I? I got 10 written down here in one of my notes here, but I'm going to forget that. I don't have time. Paragraph 8, spiritual disciplines, those saying no to the six negatives, saying yes to the five positives, they don't earn anything. They position your heart to receive the, like a cold heart in front of the bonfire of God that tenderizes our heart. Paragraph I, now Jesus addresses the issue of worry and fear. He goes, you know, you're not going to be successful in resisting the six negatives you're not going to really stay steady at pursuing the five positives, the prayer, the fasting, the giving blessing, if you're filled with fear and worry. If you're preoccupied, I'm not going to have enough. I'm not going to have enough. I'm going to be left out. If, if it, Jesus said, being the ultimate human psychologist, he goes, if fear or worry, saying the same thing, two different ways, dominates in your heart, it's going to be so distracting, you're not going to stay steady on saying, neg uh, resisting the negatives or pursuing the positives, so he addresses it. He says, have confidence. I see what's going on. Don't yield to worry. If you yield to worry, you'll be taken out of the game. You'll lose your energy to do the five positives. You won't, you won't wanna pray, fast, give, bless, serve. You won't wanna do those. You'll be huddled back and, oh no, what about me? What's my position? Where's my money? Where's my friends? Oh no, everybody forgot me. Jesus, no, 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 no. Lay that down, lay that down. That will completely dominate your inner conversation with me. I know all those things. I love you. I'm on your team. You're on my team. Lay those things down at my hand, put them in my hands, and get back in the game. Say no to the negatives, yes to the positives, and get a vibrant heart. That's what he's saying right there in that passage. Then Roman numeral uh, four, he goes now to Matthew chapter seven, and he talks about, this is the passage about judgment. Judge not, one of the most misquoted passages in the Bible. Because uh, what Jesus is saying now, hey, you're gonna embrace this new kingdom lifestyle. And if you embrace this new kingdom lifestyle, where well, you're saying no to immorality, you're saying no to anger, you're saying no to these six negatives consistently, I mean, you might have some failures, but you're going to repent and receive the grace of God and jump right back in and start saying no to them in a new way. You're going to embrace the five positives. You're going to pray. You're going to fast. You're going to give. You're going to serve. You're going to bless. He says, if you do that, you're going to have people mad at you. They're not going to like what you're doing. And watch out. If you do these things right, beware that you don't become judgmental of people who don't do them as intense as you do. He goes, don't get into that. That will defile you just like the worrying will of the last section. Chapter 6, don't worry or it'll defile you. Chapter 7, don't get critical. Don't get critical of the people that aren't pursuing it like you are. And don't get critical of the people that are mad at you because you are pursuing it. Let it all go. Let it all go. Don't go there. That's what he's saying in, in context to here in Matthew chapter 7. Then paragraph 10 We'll bring it right to the end here. Worship team, go ahead and come on up. He ends the whole sermon, and I, I don't, I didn't, I ran out of space here, so I didn't put the whole thing here. He describes the big storm that happens in our life, and it doesn't happen once. Throughout life, there's storms, there's pressures. Jesus is saying, now no, no, now know this: if you're committed to those eight beatitudes. you're going to resist the six negatives. You're going to pursue the five positives. You're not going to get captured by fear and anxiety. You're not going to get caught up in judgment and criticizing the people who aren't pressing in or people who are against you for pressing in. He goes, you're going to do all this. This is amazing. But know this. Build your life upon what my, the Word of God says. Because there's going to be storms, pressures that are going to hit your life intermittently. And he says, the man or woman that commits to these eight beatitudes in the midst of pressure their obedience will be tested. Every one of us, our obedience is tested. And it's not like God is at a, at a distance testing us. Worship team, come on up. Oh, they are up here. I didn't see you. <laughs> but worship team, where art thou? There they is. Okay. That when we're doing these things, we are, are, uh, we're pressing into these eight beatitudes Jesus says, now notice, you're going to be tested. Not tested where God is standing back, you know, like with a hammer in his hand, trying to catch you failing so he can smash you. No, he goes, no, I'm going to, 
I'm going to let you be proven. The pressure is going to come, and you're going to have chances to back away or chances to work the muscle deeper and go deeper and deeper. He goes, and if you do it right, he goes, you will be wise. But no, the pressures will come. You're not going to develop these eight beatitudes in a vacuum. You're going to develop them in a lifestyle where pressure is hitting you all the time, various times throughout your season of your life. Okay, paragraph eight. So here I put the summary. Again, you don't have to look at the Sermon on the Mount and know every verse in it, but you want to get the key principles. Imagine the Sermon on the Mount is like a table of contents. Jesus says, make sure, teach the eight Beatitudes. Make sure you, these six areas, you teach uh, the necessity to resist them. Don't let people just do what they want. Teach them about the danger and the need to resist those six things. Teach them about the need for these five things to do. Don't let them get captured in some crazy teaching where they don't need to engage with me in those five things. Don't let them get caught by worry. Don't let them get caught into criticism. And let them understand that if they choose these, they will be great in my sight. They'll have eternal rewards. I will give them their needs in due season. And I will be with them. And so you want to take this summary that I think is probably the most important part of the handout and again, you don't have to go to Matthew 5 to teach this. You could go to Paul's teachings or, or the, you know, John's teachings, the epistles of John's, the Old Testament. These are the principles. As a Bible teacher, I'm always looking, not always, but regularly looking at saying, okay, is the body growing in these things? And if they're not, I want to address them. And if we do that, God calls us wise. But part of my motive just to be really straightforward, Jesus said, if you teach these things, God will call you great. I go, Lord, I'm going to teach these things, man. I'm signing up, man. I'm going to teach my grandkids. I'm going to teach the kids of the neighborhood. I'm going to teach everybody these things anytime I get a chance. Amen. Let's stand. Lord, here we are. Lord, we're in your presence. Lord, we want to know this stuff. We want to go where you go and do what you do, Lord. Lord, I want to go where you go in life. I want to do what you do. I don't want to join the, the voice of the culture. I want to say what you say and do what you're doing. time on who needs to be more focused on this and the whole room needs a response I'd be the first one to you but I want to call out teachers people that are called to teach the word now everybody is in one regard but you know in your heart part of your assignment is teaching again maybe it's teaching the children in your neighborhood maybe it's your grandchildren maybe it's on the internet I don't know you're called to be a teacher and you're saying Lord I want to teach these things I want to do them but I want to teach them the reason I'm calling for teachers because when Jesus says if you do them and say them teach others that sounds easy I have found as a teacher I get more criticism by teaching these things at first I thought, well, I'll teach them. And the Lord says, you don't know. There's a surprise coming. Resistance if you teach these things. But you're saying, Lord, I don't care. I want to teach these things. I want to make them known in my generation. It's going to take courage. It's going to take perseverance. People are going to write you off. They're going to be mad at you if you teach these things. Who are you to tell us that's the way to live? The culture is against this, even in the church. Many are against these kind of principles. Lord, here we are. I say yes. Lord, I want to do these and teach them. I want to do these and I want to teach them. No matter what the stigma is in the culture, even in the church today. 
If you talk about prayer and fasting, they'll call it legalism. If you talk about sexual purity, they'll say, yeah, but you're just stuck in the archaic old ways. If you talk about anger, they'll come up with some reason why it's okay to be angry. Lord, I say yes to your leadership. Lord, I say I say yes to your leadership. Yes to leadership. No matter what it looks like, I sign up once We have to bless the people that are resisting us. We have to love our enemies. We have to do good to those that are using us. I don't like that in the flesh. But it frees our heart if we do it. Lord, I ask for the spirit of grace right now. As for the eight beatitudes, the eight beatitudes to be anchored. In your ways. Are you merciful when somebody disagrees with you? Are you tender with them? This is my desire. I want to be thinking of your marriage. Thinking of your roommates. Thinking of the people on your worship team. God, I want to be poor in spirit. I want to hunger and thirst. I want to walk in mercy. I want to be pure in my responses. I want to do what you say, Lord. I want to display your heart. I want to display your heart. Lord, I want to walk it out. That you would be seen through my life. I want to display your glory in my life. I want mercy. I want purity. I want to bear persecution with grace. Walk in your ways. Want to display your glory. I don't want to fight back with a wrong spirit like they do in the culture. And I will walk in your ways. Want to display your glory. I'll be a testimony. I say thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the kindness, the way you lead. Lord, I ask you for inspiration tonight as we stand before you all over this room. Divine inspiration. Revive my heart once again. Revive my heart once again. Cause the light of the face you shine. said you will be like a wise man if you built your house on these eight beatitudes to build my life you build your life what you on these eight beatitudes said. you're wise if you do that Let your word be written on my heart. Let your word be 
Lord, I ask you for the release of your spirit in this room right now. Inspiration. Breathe upon my heart. Breathe upon my heart today, Lord. Bring life to what was dry.
ask for the renewal, the refreshing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we love your presence, Lord. Oh, we love to love you. We love you, Jesus. Come and revive my heart once again. Lord says, even you can be great in my sight. Even you can be great in my sight. Doesn't matter what station of life you're in. Doesn't matter who is supporting you or who's behind you. The Lord says, my eyes are on you. You can be great in my sight. According to your word, revive. Great in your sight. Be great in your sight. I wanna be great in your kingdom. Oh, come and revive my heart. Oh, we love your leadership.
afraid But I'll embrace the flame the wind mm -hmm. and I won't be afraid I'll embrace the flame Awake Awake, awake, go oh north wind Awake, awake, go oh south wind Testing and come winds of refreshing. 